secret of online distance learning, getting to know your crew, name, face, and story. Um, the first thing I gotta I have to do is uh, ask you guys if you're okay with us recording. If you aren't okay, please turn off your camera. If you are okay, then leave your camera on. I also ask that you might mute your mic uh, during the presentation. However, um, this is interactive, so if you have a question, please type it in the chat, or you can unmute your mic and ask it um, when one of our presenters is kind of in between a sentence. Um, I'll be trying to monitor the chat, and uh, if you put your question on the chat, I will try and get that question answered um, at the next opportunity. Our presenters for today are some amazing educators, um, Prezi Paluan, excuse me, Danny Cash, David Terrio, and Greg Berger as our instructional designer. Today we'll be dealing with primarily two of the California standards for teachings, or CSTPs. The first one is engaging and supporting all students in learning. The second one is creating and maintaining effective learning environment for student learning. Now I'm gonna have our presenters introduce themselves. The first one I'd like to, or first person I'd like to start with is uh, Prezi, excuse me. Prezi, you're up. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Prezi Bulwan. I teach science um, and AP research, and I teach in the Academy of Sustainability and Engineering at Edison. Um, and I also just started um, as their new MTSS TOSA. I also added that I'm a lifelong student because I myself am, am in a program, and I'm just probably always going to be in some sort of program because I like to learn. Um, I am a dog mom to two Husky mixed rescues. One is a Husky Samiad. Um, the other one is a Husky Border Collie, I think. They're both rescues, so we're not sure. Um, the one on the left is Nova, or sometimes I say Nova Boba. Um, and the one on the right is Sirius Black. Uh, I am, I come from an international family from Indonesia. Um, we reunite once or twice a year, usually in another country for the holidays. And my guilty pleasure is ice cream sandwiches. I, I've gone up to eating like three per day, and it's terrible, but it's also so good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Crazy. And now I'd like to introduce you to Danny Cash, who's one of our presenters as well. Take it away, Danny. Hey, gang. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm working off an iPhone six here, so <laughs> my kids are doing school in the other room with the good tech stuff. Anyway, I graduated at uh, Huntington Beach High School, and I've been at Ocean View since 1998. I love the outdoors, and um, got a couple pictures there. I dragged my kids to the Grand Canyon last year, and the waterfall picture is in Sequoia. I go there every year. And uh, that's my daughter's dog, which has kind of become my little companion over the last few months. So I've been walking him every day, and he's kind of been my, my good buddy getting me through this. So, so glad everybody's here. Glad to be here and connecting with you all. Thanks, Danny. Now I have the pleasure of introducing David Terrio as a, one of our expert presenters. David? Hi, everybody. David here. Uh, I've been teaching for 25 years now, and <laughs> it feels like just yesterday. And obviously, I love sharing ideas a lot. I also like sharing food. I like combining the two. So if you ever want to invite me over for lunch, I'll bring the food and we can share some ideas. That'd be great. Uh, my son had played three sports his whole life, and we were always a really busy family. And I'd always wanted to go to spring training, and it never happened. And last year, he graduated from Fountain Valley. And so I, we planned a special trip to go to spring training this year and we got to spring training and COVID hit and we didn't even get to see a single game. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that was the beginning to my spring and it's just been interesting ever since then. Um, and I have some websites. Everything I do is free. I don't sell books or TPT or anything else like that. So, um, there'll be links here. You can click on our slide deck when we're done. And I, Everything I do, I share. I'm not saying it's the best, um, but I'll let you know when I when I write a blog post whether it worked or not, or what you need to do to make it work better. So, um, so speaking of my own story, I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, a movie story. And Ed, next slide, please. 
All right, for those of you who have never seen Castaway, or for those of you who have seen Castaway, um, a man is, he's uh, on, on an island all alone, right? And he gets so lonely that he kind of forms a bond with this volleyball, right? And you're like, oh, how attached could you really get to a volleyball? Well, you can get this attached. Next slide. Yeah, that attached. <laughs> and that's a really, really important lesson for us all as teachers because our students, they crave us being in the classroom and that attachment and that relationship and we crave the same way. Next slide. Yeah, this is me in the classroom with one of my classes and you know, we, I, we do family Fridays every other Friday and we really try and create like a, you know, a bond. Um, I'm not their dad. They're not my kids. We're just all one family, right? And that's really important. And it's hard to do online. I teach a hybrid online class. I've taught a hybrid online class for the last five years. And that class, I struggle the most with creating a community because you don't have that face-to-face -face time. But it's really important. Oh, the, sorry, the trash truck is just driving by. So if you hear anything in the background, um, sorry about that. So that relationship, it's really important. And next slide. I'm going to show you an example of this. So this is uh, my former student, Sam. He just graduated from UCLA. And I just saw this tweet of his. He just tweeted this. I, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so perfect. And so he was in a class and a teacher said, get in a group of three. I'll give you 100 regardless of the quality. And Sam says, I don't think a single one of us thought to give him a bad essay. If you build a relationship with your students, they'll do quality work for you, not a grade. And I absolutely 100% believe that. Um, that's not to say that every single one of my kids is doing all their work during COVID. Like we all know that's a whole different situation going on. But name, face, story, and building relationships, it's not just about student engagement. It improves the quality of your student work. So it's an investment of time. I am going to spend time making sure my students know who I am and making sure I know who they are because it's going to pay really big dividends. So next slide. Okay, so this is how I start the school year. Um, well, in the past, I used to always start the school year with a test on the first day and then some written assignment on the second day. I wouldn't even talk to him till day three. And it, my nickname was Mr. Scaria. <laughs> uh, about six years ago, my wife was like, why do you start off every year being a jerk? You're not a jerk. And I was like, oh, that's just my thing. And she said, well, make it not your thing. So this is what I've been doing for the last six years, and it's so much better. On the very first day of school, I show a video, and then have the kids take out a piece of paper and have them write three things they're scared about. And they, they write them down, and they draw little pictures for each one. Then we watch another video, and I have them, and it's I'm not going to go over the whole lesson, but I, they watch another video. Then I have them write down and draw three things that they love. And we, it, it takes kind of the whole day and we just talk about the things we're scared of and the things we love and we really kind of get to know each other and stuff like that. It's kind of great. Then next slide. Okay. What's going to eventually happen is, so usually we start on Wednesdays, right? And so we, we do this kind of whole activity on, the, on Wednesday. On Friday, we're going to revisit this. So I just want to let you know, like I'm letting them work on this. Wednesday night, Thursday, and on Friday, we're going to get back to it because I don't want something due the next day. Same thing with your online class. Don't have something due the next day. Let's go ahead. Next slide. Ed. Okay. Second day. Second day. I used to do an interest inventory. It was great because they were quiet and I was quiet and that second day was perfect. And they would just sit down and write an interest inventory. And now instead, what I do is I have a slideshow and I show them all sorts of stuff about me. And I'm not gonna show you the whole slideshow, but they get to see all sorts of stuff about me. And then they're gonna make a similar slideshow and they're gonna share it with me. And what I really like about this is that on the first slide, I have them do two pictures. So a front shot and a side shot. And I tell them nobody else is gonna see this. And then on the next slide, perfect. I have their, my name and then a picture of me saying who I am. And what I do is I take those two slides off of every single slide deck 
and I put them into one big slide deck and I have a way of memorizing students' names. So I have a slide of just their picture with no name and then a picture of them with their name and how to pronounce their name. And I can sit in the DMV or anywhere and just slide through this Google slide deck memorizing kids' names, which is pretty awesome. Next slide, Ed. And then I'll, I'll ask for them for a picture of them and their family. I think this is really good for me to know, you know, how big is their family? Are they an only kid? Um, and then next slide. And I'll do like little random stuff. Like they get to find out that I'm, I'm kind of wacky sometimes. Also, I do all the cooking for my family. I also do all the dishes for my family. Uh, <laughs> and then next slide. And then I really like this, I'll, I'll have a slide. I wanna know what brings a smile to their face and they get to know what brings a smile to my face. And this is a chance for them to see like, oh, look at all the things that Mr. Terrio likes. And then I get to see all the different things that they like. And I also show them how to put in links. So maybe there's like a link to something else. So there's just a lot of ways of getting to know. Them. Then day three hits, next slide. Okay. So day three is them sharing. What they do is they create a story of that where the uh, antagonist is something that they don't like and the protagonist is something that they love. So I try and teach them right away that there's a lot of difficulties going on in life, but the things that we love carry us through them, right? The scared is scared of all the things we love. And so, but in order for me, because they're going to have a lot of anxiety in my class there, as you can see, the student is worried about getting an F. So I need to know what they love so we can work together on getting them past what gives them anxiety. Now, I'm letting us all know here in this room, we don't know what school is going to be like when we get back. Maybe it's 100% face-to-face and we're all back. That would be the best. Okay. But then all of a sudden, in a week or two, boom we're right back on quarantine. Like we don't know. Um, or maybe we're just half time and we get, we start off just a little bit. You have got to take those first couple of days. They seem so precious, right? To get to know them. So they'll buy into all of your content the rest of the time. If for some reason we start full distance, like if we start full distance, which I don't want, nobody wants, but maybe that's the reality of it. I would do everything I just said using loom i would make a screencast of me talking to them with a slide deck and have them go through this activity and have them just watch it in canvas right and i would do the same thing i would have a day one activity in a module would be that little introduction a day two would be me going through the slide introducing myself and then asking them to make the same slide and then day three i would probably have them do all of their shares in a flip grid and then we could watch them all in class together, okay? Or I could do something live, um, but I'm not here to talk about live interactions with students. Um, Prezi's gonna talk to you about live interaction. So next slide, Ed. Thanks, David, that was great. Thanks for sharing with us. Now I'd like to turn it over to Prezi. Prezi? All right, so we've talked about that name face story. Now we're gonna talk about what this looks like in a live virtual setting. Um, I'm sure we're all comfortable with the on-campus setting and the brick and mortar. So now we're learning to transition um, to apply these and implement them in the live um, online setting. Um, so first, why? Well, other than COVID, um, there are actually a lot of benefits of doing live virtual instruction um, for teachers and for students. So um, some benefits include the transition from brick and mortar. Um, by doing live instruction, it is not exactly the same thing as brick and mortar, but it's similar enough or possibly as similar as we could get um, to brick and mortar, um, which really helps for the students transition to online learning. Um, it also contributes to the positive classroom environment. So the name face story that we were just talking about, while most of us are probably used to doing this in person, these can actually also be implemented online. Um, and again, it's not the same as brick and mortar, but it does allow us to create that positive classroom environment with our students just by being there face to face live with them. Um, it also helps students develop and maintain a structured routine. If you go with, let's say, the bell schedules and tell students that your expectations are for them to be online with you during that time, um, it allows them to have the opportunity to really structure it into their routine um, and, you know, maintain that routine and moving forward. 
Uh, lastly, it also allows for live feedback and Q and A's. As you can see on the right side of your screen, there's a chat box where students can, or we can all chat with each other. Um, if we have an opportunity for Q and A, students can unmute themselves and ask you questions. And if you're presenting your screen like we're doing right now, um, you can show your presentation or you can even go over assignments with students. Um, I actually started doing live instruction um, once we started moving forward again with content. Um, once um, yeah, once we started moving forward with content and then about a week into it, I uh, sent out a survey to my students. Um, I didn't get as many responses as I was hoping, um, but this is actually one of the responses um, over on the right side of the screen here um, as to whether or not they attend the live instruction or they watch the recording. Now, it doesn't show any that say neither, but that's probably the rest of my students who didn't take the survey um, or maybe they, they do attend class and they just didn't take the survey. But as you can see, there's a large majority of students who attend class. Um, some of them just watch the recording. Um, and the remainder of the students who answered this or who took the survey did both. This one was, I was a little bit surprised about because I didn't think that they would want the repetition um, as much, but some students did report going back to the recordings to see if they missed anything or cover content over again. Um, these were other survey responses. Now, there were more questions on the survey, um, but I did ask them to reflect on how their classes transitioned to virtual learning. Again, this was just the for after the first week we were back um, to moving forward with content. And I asked them, based off of what your other classes in my class are doing, what is working? Um, and these are some of the responses that were sort of repeated. This was an open-ended question. Um, but a lot of the students said over and over again that the virtual meetings were working, their teachers were communicating well, um, the weekly plan was a huge one, um, online chat programs, online class to explain the assignments. So you can keep reading through the slide, um, but it really reflects based off of what the students feel is helpful, um, that live instruction really is helpful for them. All right, so what does live instruction look like? Well, the most, the tool that I use most often is screen share. I have a lot of presentations um, and I've been making a little bit more just because with live instruction, sorry, the siren's in the background. Um, but with live instruction, it's easiest to share my screen, whether it's a presentation or if I'm showing them an assignment and I'll, I have more photos of what the assignments look like, um, or I wanna play a video for them and make sure they're all watching it at the same time. Um, I can share my screen. Um, I also take advantage of the chat box on the right side, whether it's like in this photo, I sent them documents through chat box so they could open the, the documents up. Or if, if I ask them questions, I allow them to respond via the chat box or by unmuting themselves. And it really allows students to engage um, live during the actual instruction. Um, and even the shy students, sometimes I'll get shy students who type into the chat because they wouldn't normally say it out loud, but they do want to participate. And so they'll chat, uh, type it into the chat box instead. Crazy, we have a question. Um, oh, the question is, if there's, a, are there any concerns about students using your recordings and modifying them or messaging them? Um, I've seen many examples of that online and it's prevented me from jumping into live discussions. Um, I actually haven't had any like Zoom bombing or well Google Meets bombing. I haven't had any at all. Um, so I have heard of that as well. There is the, uh, you do have the ability to kick students out. Um, and we're gonna talk about recordings in a little bit, but I restrict um, recordings to uh, people with the HB domain, HB UHSD domain. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the way that I've, approached it. Oh, editing my video. So when I when I um, do these live instructions, I actually turn my camera off. Um, yeah. And then I did not require attendance. Um, in the future, though, I could. Um, the very first day I did live instruction, I took attendance so that I could email the students who didn't um, show up just to say, hey, I didn't know. I don't know if you knew, but we're doing live classes. Here's what you missed and so on and so forth. Um, did I get all the questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple comments. I think we're good. For time's uh, purposes, we gotta kind of move on. Okay. Um, 
So some of the other apps that I use to sort of uh, support live instruction, um, I have an app called Epic Pen. I actually have a touchscreen laptop um, and a pen, so I'm able to write on it. You don't need to write on the screen um, and record what's being written. You don't need um, to have a touchscreen, though. You can actually just uh, write these with your mouse. Um, or if it does get pretty messy if you try and write it with your mouse. So another option is to actually physically type stuff into your slides or your notes or your docs or whatever it might be. And if you're sharing your screen, students can see it live. Um, so these two examples are actually from my physics classes. On the left side, I, have to, I like to show work and model instruction for them. Um, so I take advantage of the pen. Um, and then on the right side, I, I model by typing it into the actual text boxes. And sometimes I'll also ask questions um, and students can again answer in the chat or unmute themselves to, uh, to respond and, and sort of be engaged in the presentation. Um, some other live instructional activities and resources. So I do a lot of, I do all of my assignments actually on Google Docs or Slides. Um, and I am a lab science teacher, so it has been kind of a struggle to um, convert um, my documents over to that, but it still does work. Um, the top is an example where I leave a text box and I have students make a copy um, and so they can write their responses into the slides. Um, the bottom one is blurry, so I apologize for that, but it's the doc, Google Docs version. Um, again, they just type their responses into the text box. Um, and I, yeah, and then upload it, and that's how they submit it. Um, sorry, I'm pausing again for questions. I see a few on the side. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, one of them was, uh, what app you, did you use for writing problems on your screen? So I do this. I typed it into the chat there. And then a lot of people were answered already. So that's great. Epic. <laughs> that's perfect. So um, I'm going. Yeah. So something else actually I, I was iffy about trying, but it worked out really well. I did group projects and presentations. Um, and I actually had them present. It was optional. They could either present during class or they could record themselves presenting. And then it was optional to have their cameras on or just do their audio. Um, but I had them do the same thing where they shared their screen and then as a group, they would sort of piggyback off of each other and present their work. And it actually worked out really well. Um, and so that's still an option. I know that um, there's been a question of being able to do that online, but it definitely is still something that is doable. And recordings. So I, like I mentioned earlier, I do actually record my instruction. Reason being, um, when I asked the kids, you know, towards the beginning or in that survey that I showed you guys some of the uh, responses to, I do have some students who can't make class because they've taken up some extra job or maybe it's zero period and they can't wake up as early um, while they're at home or whatever it might be. Um, that's actually why I record instruction. This allows for both asynchronous and synchronous instruction. So students who are there with me live will be getting that synchronous instruction and then students who need to look back at the videos can work at their own pace. Um, it's also helpful for students with slow internet. My internet actually bugs out sometimes too and I know that that's a huge issue um, or it's a huge sort of question mark, but if students do have issues with internet, um, it gives them the opportunity to look back at the recording um, to see what they might have missed. Um, so, like I said, I actually have all the students turn their cameras off and I myself turn my camera off as well. So during the actual recording, um, nobody's cameras are on just in case. Um, and so far, at least it hasn't, it hasn't uh, brought any issues. Um, that In that case, though, I did change my syllabus wording. Um, and I do have samples of that if it's not the best yet. Um, there's always room for improvement. But um, if you adjust your syllabus wording and go over the syllabus with them, um, that's what I did. And it, it seems to work out. Praise um, me. Uh, there's a question. Um, how often uh, a week do you provide a live lesson? I actually taught on modified Mondays and block Tuesday, Thursday, uh, wait, Tuesday through Friday. Sorry. So I was basically teaching as if we were back on campus or with the same bell schedule as if we were back on campus. Um, I just shifted my zero period a little bit since there was no tutorial. Um, it wasn't me lecturing the whole time though. Um, sometimes I would show some lectures. Other times I would explain an assignment and then I would just 
stay in the chat room, stay in the meeting room. So if students, so students could work and ask me questions as they uh, worked. I don't have small children, but I have two. I have the two dogs that are very, very needy. I'm sure not. It's not the same as children. I know, but um, yeah, I, I get dogs barking in the background or popping into the into the room um, quite often. Every time, actually. All right, I have a lot more um, other resources as well. Um, I use Nearpod, um, you can use Pear Deck, Flipgrid, all these different things um, as uh, resources. Um, but I didn't want to bombard us all with information since I know we're front loading a lot here. So yeah, that, that about wraps up my, um, my portion here. Thank you, Prezi. Um, we appreciate you sharing all those um, tits with the, tidbits with us. And now here's Danny to talk about building community. Danny? All righty, gang. Uh, my presentation, I would say it's more of a testimonial of just the experience of something new that I tried this year. And my audience, I know there's about almost 100 teachers joining us, but if you're a beginning Canvas user and you're overwhelmed and about trying other new things, uh, the beauty of the real simple thing that I would like to share is it's something that's already embedded in Canvas. You don't have to learn an external tool. It's already built into Canvas. Many of you probably already use this, but for me, like a math teacher, uh, giving verbal feedback, it's kind of difficult to do digitally because I'd much rather be looking at the student's work and annotating their math equation or whatever. But so giving verbal feedback is at least for me, it's been very awkward to do digitally uh, over complex math, math situations. So uh, before I share that very, very simple tool, I just want to echo something that uh, David said earlier, because, you know, I teach mostly juniors and seniors. And when our district and our school kind of went to this smart start, I was like, I had a real bad attitude because I was like, I'm not really into this touchy feely stuff. I'm teaching AP stat here, pre-calculus let's start with a quiz and you know really set things straight in the first day of school and let them know who's boss and that this is going to be about curriculum and not about you know so i was real uh, had a real negative attitude about it but it did bear a lot of fruit because i think with that uh connection made in the first couple of days it really helped me get to know my kids uh and they're you know, the, the relationship was already established. And when you start with that, the curriculum kind of rides the coattails of that. So, um, and even though I've been a TRT at Ocean View for over 10 years, and I've helped a lot of teachers with technology, um, you know, trying every conceivable thing. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I do not feel comfortable in my classroom up until about November. I feel like there are strangers in my room in September, in October. I don't know their names. They're kind of feeling me out and reading my, lang my body language. I don't really know how to act in my own classroom. And then once I start to warm up to them and they warm up to me, we have a great rest of the school year. Um, but this one tool that I'd like to share with you, in, in addition to the Smart Start ideas, has really sped up that process where I'm now starting in the very first week feeling much more comfortable in my own classroom. Um, let's see. So that's kind of a little background to what I like to share in, in my experience. And the reason why I tried this new um, thing in Canvas, and I cannot believe I've overlooked it because I've done so many other techie tools, but I have not utilized this speed grader thing until this year. And I cannot believe, uh, you know, I've been using Canvas for six years. But I started to teach a hybrid pre-calculus class, and I would only see students one, once a week. And so I wasn't able to interact in the classroom as much with these students. And even when they were in the classroom, I felt like time was very precious. I had to get to curriculum. I didn't have time for getting to know them. But I have found by using the speed grader, um, if you go to the next slide, please. And at the very bottom of this slide, it has a link to the, um, to the specific thing in the Canvas guide about leaving comments. So on the left there where the pink arrow is pointing, that's just a real simple one-liner comment that I made to a student. You know, the student submitted a four-page four, uh, 
submission there and I just made a real quick comment about something that he mentioned in there and he was really surprised that I took that I made note of a detail that he commented on it it, it really meant a lot to him and I, I don't even remember leaving the comment so it goes to show you that sometimes uh, these little one-liners we do to kids just because a lot of students uh, may perceive me as just giving them full credit for trying the assignment full credit trying the assignment but to actually make a comment about some detail that they have made in the work, it I think validates uh, the assignment to them that you're not just giving them drill and kill uh, work to do. And on the right where the green arrow is pointing, that's the video uh, response. And that's not, I don't have to use Google Meets, I don't have to use Zoom, I don't have to use anything. It's already within Canvas. I click the video submission, I use my webcam on my computer and it sends it directly to the student. And once again, that is something that I commented on the student's work. And I was, you know, the student happened to be working for Blaze Pizza, and I just kind of threw that in the video that, you know, I'll be coming by and visiting her, and, and uh, that really just meant a lot to her. Uh, so, um, let's see here. So, once again, that's something already within Canvas that you could use. It's, it's built in there. Um, hmm. Oh, summer homework. Those of you who are teaching, I, I teach AP classes and uh, honors classes, and I've always given summer homework. This is the first year that I'm already in the summer homework asking them some getting to know you questions. So those of you who give summer homework, even if you can attach one thing uh, to the student's name and face, that they're on the water polo team or that they're on ASB, if you could attach that to that person and reply to one of their submissions this summer via uh, a short comment or a video i i think that would help us hit the ground running in september or late august so i'm looking to do the smart start as a summer start here i would like to hit the ground running with a little bit of connect because unfortunately i don't think we're going to be back live as much as we're going to want to be next school year so that's a little something that I've done. I've altered the summer homework to just throw a little bit of, um, even though the math that I'm asking them to do is going to take about 90 minutes total for the whole summer, I also incorporated a little getting to know you uh, information in there. And then I'm going to just be simply using these comments, the verbal, uh, or the written, or the video to connect with each student. And uh, I've only done one live meeting during this COVID thing, and I just didn't feel comfortable. I've, I've done a lot of videos, maybe at least 100 video comments to people, but I have not tried to conduct um, a live lesson, even though I, I do record math videos and send them out. So those of you who were that the live teaching is not working for you or you're not willing to venture in that, do not underestimate the power of video itself that you can give a comment instead of to a class, you can give a comment to a specific student. And it really, uh, in my experience this year has changed my teaching. And this, this kind of went on, like I said, at the beginning of the school year before COVID hit. So uh, that is my testimonial about as a real simple tool, just not just giving students scores, uh, using the grade book, but just giving a simple comment that's personal in written form or video form. Danny, there's a couple questions. Um, one of them is, do they need to adjust their notifications? That I don't know. Um, I'll have to look into that because I've just been assuming because students have been responding to my video comments. I don't know if that's a default setting, but I will definitely get back to you. But uh, I think Chris Long or a couple people are in the meeting with us. They can chime in and answer that. I, because I, I just been assuming all my students been getting my comments. Now the oh, uh, Chris the, answered. He said, the way that Canvas is built, um, you know, on uh, as a teacher, you'll see it as well. If you go to your dashboard, first thing you see when you go into Canvas, there's a section on the right that says uh, to do, and then there's also a section underneath that that says feedback. And one of the several areas that they can get that feedback is right in that section. So they'll see like if they're in the dashboard view, they'll see like all the feedback for all their courses. But if they click on Danny's uh, pre-calculus course, they would see recent feedback 
that's specific just to his course. And then of course, they can get push notifications on their app if they're using the app. They can get emails and uh, they can also see it in the grades page. There's another question. It says, if we annotate within the file uh, that the student submitted, can the students see the annotations? That I don't know. <laughs> Chris? I, I'm a yes. beginner. <laughs> yeah, if, if, what was the question? If the... Uh, if, you, if they annotate within the file about what the student submitted, can the students see the annotations? Yeah, so if they submit a file like a PDF or something like that, um, if you're using SpeedGrader, you'll see an annotation tool built right into SpeedGrader. Uh, and you can mark up on that. You can circle things, um, leave text comments, and they will see the annotations. Um, but that's one of those things at the beginning of the year that I would encourage you to make part of some exercise that you do. Like you have some sort of a getting to know you assignment or something that they're turning in, and then you leave them feedback, and then you, you make sure everybody knows that they were able to get that feedback. And if anybody hasn't, then you could send them a link to the Canvas guide on how do I view annotations. Like I, I'll put that link in the chat. Great. Ed, Go Ed this is David. Um, I just want to add in one more thing to what Danny just said. And I just really discovered this uh, at the beginning of this year. I had never even seen it before. But when you're in your Canvas inbox, you know how students can leave you messages and you can leave them messages. I never realized that at the top there, you can, um, when you go to where it says unread or starred or sent, the bottom choice is submission comments. And if you click that, you can in one place see all of the submission comments that you've left to students and all the ones that they've replied back to you. So I think sometimes like, you know, you don't want to have to go back into the speed grader to see what they have said or what you've said or, you know, whatever. You can just follow that conversation along. If there's any follow up to anything you've asked them in this submission, you can follow along inside your inbox, which I find a lot easier. Thanks, David. I want to thank Danny. Um, you can also learn more about this topic from our Canvas instructional designer, uh, who is Greg Bergner. Burger, excuse me. And um, at this time, if anybody has any other questions they want to ask, this would be the opportunity. If not, we have a couple things that we'd like to introduce to you. Any questions? Prezi, do you want to uh, talk about myths and realities of virtual education? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I can. Um, so I have this sort of document here um that i thought was helpful for distinguishing between the myths and realities of virtual instruction and so i'll paste it into the so it's in the chat right now um if you'd like to take a look if you want to fill it out you can absolutely feel free to or just you know ponder uh, upon it um but there's a lot of sort of misconceptions between transitioning or just using um virtual instruction, virtual education as compared to uh, brick and mortar instruction. And so uh, my partner in, a, in the program that I'm in, we put this together um, to really sort of clarify that or, yeah, clarify um, that virtual instruction is just a tool. At the end of the day, we are instructors, we've learned different tools and we've been using brick and mortar tools um, for the most part. Um, but at the end of the day, we are still instructors and we are still teaching, you know, students the way that we're teaching them. Um, and yeah, virtual instruction is just another way to go about that. We're not necessarily changing, um, you know, all aspects of education. It's just we're just changing one of the tools that we relay the content through which we relay the content to them. Um, so yeah, it's just a true or false sort of myth versus reality type thing that I thought might be helpful to get our minds um go in there we do thank you for sharing that with us and um, we do have a couple more questions that i noticed in the chat um one was what about some of the other grading tools like pen one and teardrop one where we can mark their paper and leave comments i left many of uh i left many of those but i'm not sure if they ever saw them anybody want to comment on that 
Yeah, I've never used those tools before, so I'm not really sure. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, so Chris shared the link to how to show them, and that was exactly what I needed. Oh, perfect. No, so, I appreciate that, it. That Chris guy is pretty good. We should hire him. <laughs> Give him a raise. Right? You know, um, we didn't want to overwhelm people with too many things here, but I just want to remind everybody that research has shown that what's one of the things students want the most is for you to be present in your classroom. And being present looks like a lot of different things. It could just be you leaving a, a picture, like just a picture of the week. Like, you know, what did you, what are you doing in your life this week? Or a little video, like you're on a walk and you just leave a one minute video, like not, not edited, nothing. Just leave a one minute video once a week. Put a picture of yourself or your dogs or your kids in an assignment. Like just that, oh, I'm in an assignment and I'm seeing more than text. Like I'm, I'm learning more about my teacher as they go. And maybe even in the assignments, if they can leave a little something of their life inside the assignment, a, a, a picture of a shadow, if you're doing something in math or science, you know, a picture of uh, something that's in their backyard or in the front yard or something like that. But just those little tiny ways of being present in your virtual class are really important. Uh, probably time for one more question. Anybody? Mind, there's something burning there, I know. Okay. All right, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Danny, Crazy, David, and Greg for sharing and working so hard on this presentation. Um, I'm Ed Begani, thanking, thanking you for what you do for our students, and thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. <laughs>